let me ask you a question. Many of us in our power of attorney documents express the preference that if a guardian needs to be appointed, that it be the one that they have appointed as power of attorney. How would the New Jersey courts react to that? I mean, presumably the person who did the power of attorney while they were still had capacity, expressed the preference. How do the judges uh, handle that? Well, that's your experience. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's also a uh, provision put in a lot of wills um, where you'll appoint, um, you know, their various fiduciaries. What the judges will do, uh, I meant where the person who may be a guardian will identify someone they want to appoint as a, a successor guardian. It's the same situation. Um, to the extent that the courts, well, the courts aren't bound by. Let's put that, they're, you know, you, they're not, they're, their hands aren't tied to appoint the person that you identify. But um, that said, I mean, if, unless the, um, the, unless they make a finding or there's a showing that it would be an affirmatively harmful appointment, that person will probably be appointed. No, so it is good to, to identify, you know, the, the, that's why when we do wills, we'll say, Hey, your guardian for your son, let's identify who would be the best successor guardian. Is the courts aren't bound by it, but unless an, an opponent can prove that there's somehow somehow they're going to be harmful for the, uh, to the ward by appointing your chosen successor, your successor is going to be appointed. Same thing with the power of attorney. Most probably going to be appointed. But there, like I said, if there is a, a challenge, it's probably going to be a trial, but the fact that it's in there is going to help out a lot. All right, the other question that I had, uh, in our, in my particular county, when the court has to appoint a attorney for the alleged incompetent, they go to this list that's been made up, and they pick the next one on the list. I'm familiar with that list. <laughs> and let it be said that some of the people on that list can't spell the word guardian. <laughs> so how how is something like this you know, I mean, shouldn't there be some type of qualification to be on that list? Or what's your thought on that? Well, that list, um, you know, if you ha if you have a list where they're actually trying different people, um, I. It's better than some counties where there's, it's the, the list has been closed for a long time. They'll have a, a group, half a dozen people, and they those group, those people always get appointed. Yeah, there is there there are lists. Judges have lists in every county. People who appear before them quite often, and those are the people that often will be appointed as um, as guardian ad litem, as court appointed counsel. Um, it's. It's a very difficult situation. If you get somebody appointed as a guardian ad litem, then they are, um, you know, they have bad judgment, let's say. Uh, very, very difficult to overcome. They have the judge's confidence, um, and it's an uphill battle. That's all I can say. Uh, I've never been able to get anyone removed. I've been able to point out, you know, numerous errors uh, in judgment, in action of court appointed counsels, but nobody has ever been removed. So you're, you know, you're really uh, stuck. It's, uh, when you practice in the area uh, a lot, you know, you think long and hard before you ask for a court appointed counsel because that person's judgment is often to carry the day. If you get a, a bad one, you're really in, you know, you're really in, in trouble. Questions, sir? Yeah. Um, I'm for the position I think I know the point. Uh, this is highly contested. How do you deal with a situation where siblings hate each other and they're continually rehashing past grievances from decades ago and so forth and so on? And when and the sibling, by the way, time and time again, get your own lawyer. Well, Fortunately, I have this person signing a letter to me saying, you know, I'm not your lawyer. You should get one. Um, okay, well, the, the situation is where, where the siblings are, they hate each other and they're arguing about 
Um, I guess they're arguing about who's going to be the guardian or the care that mom is going to get. Yeah, yeah. You did this to mom 20 years ago, and you did this last week. And well, that that's going to be the subject after dawn because Kathy's going to be talking about mediation, if possible, or litigation in that area. Yeah. No, it happens too often. I mean, it happens. It happens a lot, and um, you know. What are your choices, really? You try to, if the family will sit down together, you may be able to mediate something. You just, you know, I agree with you that if you have to have everybody acknowledge that you advised them to get an attorney and they decided not to, um, you might be able to mediate it, you know, but it is, it's one, it's one out of 10. A lot of times people just die and get into court and to litigate the situation. Right. Don? And I can't on. force this guy to get a lawyer, obviously. No, you can't. Don, on an uncontested guardianship, where does your representation end? I mean, do you follow up with them? Does it end at the end of the night? Make sure they get the, nine, the accounting in within 90 days. Uh, do you do an annual follow-up with them to remind them to do the annual report? Uh, so where do you cut it off and if you continue it, how do you charge? Um, yeah, I think every attorney would have a different answer to this. I mean, in, in our uh, practice, um, we get the guardianship and people are pretty happy to end the relationship at that point. Um, <laughs> So we tell them what they have to do. I let them know the first thing you have to do is to just send a letter in uh, updating the accounting um, within the, the next three months and tell them about the annual accounting thereafter. But the representation ends at the time that we get the guardianship judgment. And you make that clear in your the retainer letter or some kind of termination letter so they don't come back to you, oh, I thought you were still representing That's true, it, I, yes, that we do that, and it's also in the judgment itself that, it, you know, that we'll just dis dismiss. Any other questions? Same question. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a good question, thank you. If you have a power of attorney and a living will, why would you need a guardianship action? Um, because uh, it, you know, under our law, the, guard, the, the power of attorney and living will may not cover the situation that you're in. It happens every day of the week. Um, one thing that, that comes to mind is um, uh, people come in, mom has decided that she doesn't want to go to the hospital. The, the son calls the ambulance, the ambulance comes, mom says, no, I'm not going, and uh, the, the, the ambulance driver says, well, the power, you know, your rights as power of attorney don't uh, exceed her rights as the principal. She says, no, I'm sorry, I can't take her. I mean, that happens in any situation. If the principal says no, even if they're incompetent, um, you know, the third party is going to listen to the principal. You've got to have a guardianship paper to make your will uh, give that precedence over, over the individual. There's like a ton of situations um, that the power, uh, you know, other than that, there's a ton of situations that the power of attorney doesn't cover. But you have incompetent people who will not recognize their best interests and will take positions contrary to what the agent wants. One of your other uh, reasons, too, is a power of attorney is a voluntary document where the principal is establishing who they want as the power of attorney. Well, if that power of attorney gets on the wrong side of the principal, the principal can say goodbye and revoke the power of attorney. And now you're arguing about do they have the capacity to revoke it, much less establish it? So one of the things that, that Don will tell you works out with guardianship is the minute that there's an appointment of the guardian, the court order typically revokes the prior power of attorney so that there's no confusion. That's right. It, it, usually the revocation of, of the prior documents will be contained in the judgment. 
So you don't have to deal with the agent or the competent uh, power of attorney or the um, healthcare proxy. Yes, sir. Wouldn't it also, on the back of the power of attorney, the principal can still write checks and still engage in all types of activities that you may not want them to or they may not be competent for? That's true. I mean, that happens a lot. Um, you know, a neighbor of mine, the, the father was uh, you know, giving money and betting on horses and uh, the Irish Derby or whatever, and uh, people were showing up at his house to, uh, to so he could pay them what, what the, the bets he was placing. There's no, uh, way, no way to stop them. I've also had the situation, I'm sure most of us have, who do estate planning, where all of a sudden the new best friend from church has a new power of attorney and there's a new will and now the kids are running in for a guardianship to say that she wasn't competent to do those documents and stop the friend from the new friend from looting mom. Mm -hmm. uh, neighbor um, case we just had um, uh, woman uh, close with her um, son-in-law. Her daughter passed away, close with the son-in-law and the grandson her whole life. Uh, her husband passes away, she goes into, you know, she has emotional um, issues, she's grieving. The neighbor comes over and all of a sudden the son-in-law is barred from going into the house. So, um, you know, there was no other, what else are you going to do? People are, um, people are barring you, you have to go to court to try to, try to get back in. And you know you're successful at it, but it takes a while, and it's it's costly. But I don't know any other way to deal with it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.